Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Last week, we, when we gathered together, we did a, a special service and uh, about passing our faith along and then picking it up. We videotaped that, and there's a number of DVDs that are here if you'd like one. And if they're gone and somebody else would like one, let me know, and I can make some more. Today, the Mullers are letting us use their video camera, so we're going to try to tape some of our sermons and hopefully try to even get them onto our website. So we're, we're in the process of getting those things together. We finished off a series through 1 Peter, which led us pretty naturally into a, a series, a follow-up here on 2 Peter. And today we're going to cover the first 11 verses. The way that I want us to look through 2 Peter is, um, you know, one of the main differences between 1 Peter and 2 Peter. 1 Peter, they're being persecuted or about to be persecuted. And in 2 Peter, the persecution is kind of laid off, but the problem is that false teachings and false teachers have come into the church. And so 2 Peter is more about facing those false teachings and, and how they can sway us away, how they're as damaging as the persecution. So... The three parts of it that we're going to look at today, the three topics that are mentioned in the first 11 verses, how do grace, knowledge, and growth fit together? What does God say about these? What did Peter want his audience to understand about these? And what happens when false teachers get a hold of them? How can we get them just a little bit off, kind of like my golf swing? Just, you know, it's a little bit off the first 10 feet. Yes, but in the next 100, or 150, or 200, it kind of, you know, it doesn't seem like much of an off to start with. Isn't that what false teaching is? It's just a little bit off-center. Just look at it this way. But yet, when you take that far enough down the line, you see how far off the middle it is. You're no longer even on the same fairway, or golf course sometimes, depending on what you're doing. So, our understanding of grace, knowledge, and growth are important. The audience is the same, first and second. It's mainly Gentile Christians, but it's from a large area, people that are quite separated away from Jerusalem. They were taught, and they felt like they were second-class Christians. They were taught, and they felt like they were second-class believers when they were under Judaism. But now they felt like they're second-class Christians. So, so 1 Peter focuses more on them understanding, but God loves you the same. The same terms that he uses for the Jews, he uses for you. God wants you to think of yourself the way that he thinks of you. And the church was persecuted. It went through a period of persecution. They were far enough away from Jerusalem. It didn't impact them quite the same, but there was a time of persecution. But now they face the false teachings and the false teachings. Sometimes it can be hard to tease those apart because the false teachings come from people. And they come from people that they know. And they come from people that they're in connection with. And to be able to say, I love you, I appreciate you, but this theology, this understanding of God is not going where it needs to go. And to be able to work that out. And false teachers and false teachings can be corrected. But it takes effort on both sides. This way or that way. What's the problem with false teaching? Is that it divides. About grace. It's a false teaching that God's grace is limited. Isn't it? Any teaching that comes around that says that God's grace is limited is false. It's also a false teaching that grace should be treated lightly, or can be treated lightly. That's going to lead you down a path that is wrong. What about knowledge? It's a false teaching that what we know about God is only intellectual. God is only concerned about what we have studied about Him. It's another false teaching that it doesn't really matter what you know. It's more about who you are. 
Or that we achieve God's grace once we know the right things. And if you forget some of those, or if you learn something else, or if you disagree, you now lose God's grace. That's also a false teaching. Grace is not connected to knowledge. But God wants us to have grace, and He wants us to grow in knowledge, and He wants us to grow. It's a false teaching that growth is everything. True. Now we can say, you know, you've, everybody better be growing, we better be growing the right rate, and we better be all growing the same way, and, and just focus and harp on the fact that we grow. But it's also a false teaching that God doesn't, He's not con concerned about growth at all. So the truth is in the middle. That God is concerned about growth, but it is not everything. He's concerned about people falling away, which requires growth and knowledge and grace. But these false teachings can slide in and they can adjust the way that we think and the way that we act towards one another. Last week, our sermon wasn't particularly intended to be either 1 Peter or 2 Peter, but it does tie in because it was a reminder about our call of witnesses. We think of how that rate uh, relates in Hebrews, and we think of how that relates within our congregation. We have a cloud of witnesses of, of people that have gone on before us, and what they taught, and what they valued, and how important their connection to God was. We learn from that, and we honor that. This week, as we get going, I want us to point out as you read through, I want you to notice some of the repeated words and concepts within the first 11 verses. And it starts with one that I've missed many times. There's a verse that, there's a word that comes up twice that I think holds more of a foundation than I've given it credit for in the past. And that's the word precious. What in your life would you describe as precious? Start thinking of those things. Well, how do you define between something that is precious or that is not? What might be the most precious thing? If you lost it all but, what's the but? What would you give up if it was taken away? What would you give up to get it or to get it back? Or what else would you surrender in order to keep the most precious things or thing in your life? If you could only have one something, what would it be? And that, that gets tough. What is precious? What have our witnesses taught us about what really is precious? What do they have to let go? What do they have to surrender? What does it teach us when we look to the witnesses of others? When we look back through the Bible and say, what was really precious to Abraham? Isaac, Jacob, David, Daniel, Paul, Peter, Matthew. We start thinking of what was precious to these people? It wasn't their car. Now, Job was it his health? He not was taken. But what was precious? What is considered precious? Well, that word just rings for me. Yeah. You'll get it in a minute. Rick, no, you were just a half second behind. What did Bilbo, Gollum, and Frodo, Saruman, and the rest consider precious? This is J.R.R. Tolkien. He writes this story to say it's the search and the, the keeping of something precious. In his story, he makes it a ring. What's the ring? The thing about the ring in the story is it's the ring that controls all other rings. It's the ring of 
power. But what happens the longer they have it? It destroys them. What they thought was precious was their undoing. And you read through, right, Abby? You can read these, not just watch them. When I watch the movies, and she reads the book, when I watch through, the story ends in getting rid of the rip. For those of you that don't know the story. What they thought was most precious, they realized is the one thing that they've got to get rid of. Because it's a lie. And it's destroying them and everybody else. And who goes in, who loses their life right at the end with the rip? Smeagol, who was Gaul. Smeagol chases it into the, the fire. Don't people do the same thing? What do people consider as precious? The ring of power? People offer their lives to power, to fame, to fortune, to family. There's one that kind of steps on those. People will give up everything for family, for love, for acceptance, for work, for pleasure. So this is how you know what's precious. And it's, at that point, it's too late to turn back. Think of it this way. What would you hold on to as your last breath ended? Is that really what's precious? Because at the end of this life, you can't take any of those with you. That's what's truly precious. Precious is found in both verse 1 and verse 4. In 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received what? A faith as precious as ours. I don't know if that's underlined in your Bible. But it was a word that I hadn't really connected with. That it really is a foundation for all of Second Peter. Because what does he say is precious? A faith. Because in your last breath, what do you take with you? Your faith. And is it more precious than fame and fortune and family and love and acceptance? And would you give up everything? everything, if it meant that or your faith. Well, that's a hard call. Would I give up my kids if it meant faith or kids? i got to go with faith. Isn't that brutal? But it's the only, because it's a faith as precious as ours. Because they know that they can hold on to their faith. And not letting them go, they're whirled onto the same thing. And here it is faith. It's the middle way. So I'll get a double with that. Uh, get take care of it. That's what is precious. So in verse 2 it says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Grace and peace be yours in how much? In abundance. Through the knowledge of God and, our, and of Jesus our Lord. We need to come to know God and to have grace and peace and abundance. This is the first time they mentions knowledge. And also, knowledge also comes up here in verse 3. Grace and peace are yours in abundance through what? Knowledge. Through a correct, doctrinal, foundational, experiential understanding of God. This verse is so good, it's a song. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. His divine power has what? It is what gives us. It gives us how much? Everything we need for life and God. 
Is that such a powerful passage? God's power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through knowledge. But if you don't know that, if you live a life ignorant of that truth, can you have this? No. It comes through knowledge of Jesus. So is that just intellectual knowledge? Have you ever heard the word? Is that enough? Well, I know the name Jesus. No, it's relational knowledge and informational knowledge. Through these, through what? Through both his glory and his goodness, he has given us. Repeat it again. He gave us everything we need and he has given us his very great and precious promise. See, the preciousness of our faith is based on the preciousness of His promise. See how those two are united? What makes one precious? What makes gold precious? What makes it valuable? It's rarity. There's not a lot of it. That's what, part of what makes it precious. We value it, it has unique principles. It doesn't tarnish. Gold is precious because of what it gives it its value. Our faith is precious because of what gives it its value. Our faith is completely tied together with the precious promises. If those promises are not true, how precious is your faith? The purity of one impacts the purity of the other. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Boy, I teased this one apart this week. Divine nature? Divine. God. Nature. What? I try to find different translations of this. What do you mean? Are you saying that we're actually like, like God because of this? Divine nature? Have you noticed that in there? God's promise, God promises a resurrection, not just a resuscitation. Remember when we were talking about that? A brand new transformed life. That's the difference between a human nature and a divine nature. That's not a resuscitation. That's a resurrection. Through God's grace, our nature is changed. Why? Because the indwelling of God within us through the Holy Spirit. We have divinity within us. That's a mindful. Before we did not. But now we do. John tells us that God is now dwelling within us. We have a divine nature. Isn't that an amazing concept? Do we only have a divine nature? No. We have a human nature as well. That's why a lot of scripture talks about the war between the two. All the flesh and the spirit. I like the way that he brings this up. The divine nature. In verse 5 he says, For this very reason. Well, what reason? That our faith and God's promises are precious. That God has given us everything we need for both life and godliness. And that we have connection to this divine nature. For this reason, which is for these reasons, make every effort to add to your... I don't want to stop there. I think we know the rest of the list. Most of us do. A lot of us know this list. Memorize it. Add to your... Add to your faith, goodness, and goodness, knowledge, and knowledge. If you just memorize it, what is he talking about? But this precedes that. 
It doesn't matter what the list is if you forget the first part. Would you agree with that? It doesn't matter what comes with add to you <coughs> if you forget the first part, that it's tied to the precious promises, that your faith is more precious, that God has given us everything. It doesn't matter what the list is if you forget that first part. Why we do what we do is important to God. So you can add to your faith goodness and a goodness knowledge. But if you don't do it because your faith is precious, because the promises are precious, because of a divine nature that's within you, it's different. God wants us to do the right thing for the right reason. False teachers teach that this list or any other list is all that's important here. So I'm looking at your life. If I don't see you add to your faith goodness, and if I don't see that it's getting added at the right rate, at the right level of growth, then you don't deserve God's grace. See, the false teachers can take any list and say the story here is about the list. The list comes from the relationship. False teachers can also say whatever else he says here doesn't matter anyways. Well, if it doesn't matter, why did he put it in? False teachers teach that this list or any list is what makes you right with God. Is that true? No. You are saved by grace. You are saved because the promise is precious. The truth is that when God is living within us, our faith grows, not because it has to, but because it's alive. And it needs to. Living things grow. So what are we making every effort to add? You notice that's not too conditional? It's not when you got spare time? It's how much effort? Make every effort to add. So is this a checklist? What's well, a reminder? Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And to love, that's the end of the list. What was the first one? Faith is the first one. What's the last one? Starts with faith, ends with love. But isn't it more of a circle? It's faith and love in demonstration, in effort, in action. It's bookended by faith and love. Faith is trust in God. Isn't it? That's what the word faith means. That's the concept behind it. If you have faith in something, you have trust in it. It's trust in God and His promises. And our faith is expressed in goodness. Well, what's that? How about being good? Too complicated for you? If you have faith, are you a better person? Do you make better choices? Yes. But it's based on those precious promises. Which leads to a better knowledge of God. A better understanding of, you know what? This is better than that. This way of doing things is good. That one is not. That knowledge is understanding. It's reading scripture and God says don't do it that way, do it this way. So I'm gaining information, but I'm also gaining relationship and application. What follows the better knowledge? His character then lives within us and we grow in self-control. How did Jesus do with self-control? Can you have self-control for a moment? Yeah. How about when you spread it out over a month? What's the next one? Perseverance. Being able to take self-control and extend the time frame. And to persevere in doing good and being controlled. 
Perseverance is what makes self-control the difficult. That develops godliness. What's the time frame that God expresses self-control? Forever. That's the godly nature. To be able to express self-control, to do good every time, forever. Why does God want us to grow in that? Because it's a better life. That leads to brotherly kindness. Because we understand that other people struggle with doing good all the time. And sometimes they don't make good choices. So that gives you an opportunity. You can then evaluate and say, you're not doing it right, so I feel better about failing. You know, I'm just looking for somebody else to mess up so I feel better about it. We're to say, let's get back to persevering. Let's be kind to one another. I need grace, you need grace. Let's share that. Brotherly kindness leads to godly love. Where you say, I want the best for you. And I want, it, I want you to help me, and I want to help you. We need to do this together. It's not a list to work on as much as it is a list of things to look for as they grow within us. <clears throat> because of a change that we consider, in what we consider as precious. Does that make sense? It's not so much a, oh, I'm going to focus on self-control and it'll make that pop out of me somehow, as it is to, if I reconsider what's precious in my life and how precious God's promises are, self-control will develop pretty naturally. Not something we just have to artificially create through huge amounts of effort. But the other, the first part, is what connects it. Because God already said, I gave you everything you need for life and godliness. I've given you everything you need to be able to do this, to live this way, to add to your faith goodness. You have all of that. You just got to let it happen. Then we have a promise and a warning. Verse 8 is the promise. It's a conditional promise. For if, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So look at that again. What keeps you from being ineffective and unproductive? These qualities. If you have these qualities, that are naturally increasing, they help you to not be ineffective and unproductive. You notice that even that's the gift? How much effort does it take to do this? Well, it's not about the effort, but the surrender. These qualities help us to make our knowledge of Jesus effective and productive. Because we know about God, we know about Jesus, we know how He lived, and if you have these qualities and they're growing. The better we know Jesus and follow his example, the more evident these traits become. See that in there? If you don't focus on Jesus, if you focus on your growth, you're putting yourself off center. And he provides a warning. <laughs> But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, which you can't actually be. Okay? They're both vision, but they're contradictory. What's nearsighted mean? You can't see what's right in front of your face. And blind is you can't see anything at all. What led to the not seeing what's right in front of your face is losing vision completely because you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins. You took your eyes off what was important. 
Knowledge develops these promises, and forgetting brings the warning. We tend to forget when we take our eyes off Jesus, making us focus on the wrong things and blind to what we need to see. That's because we're making something else more precious than that relationship with Jesus. And those of you that have studied with me for the last number of years, what's the next word? We look for the therefores. This wraps it up. Therefore, my brothers, what are we supposed to do? Be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. And the your there is not just mine. It's your. Encourage everybody to make their calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. You know what I tried to tease this one apart too? That's a pretty bold promise. You will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. These last two bits, the way that it ends, not the best translations of it. I think it's a little bit misleading. So a couple notes on this. The word fall there. Stumble and fall away to become wretched. Not just trip, but you will never fall away. Isn't that a subtle enough difference? Does this promise if you let these things grow, you'll never sin again? You'll never have a difficulty in your life? No, it's more a promise that you, if you focus on the right things, you won't fall away. And the other part is, you will be given entrance. See, the way the NIV translates it, it ties it to the rich promise, and it's more about the rich entrance. The richness of being given entrance. So the New American Standard does a better translation of this. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus will be abundantly supplied to you. Isn't that a cool concept? So when you're ready to enter, God will lavish that on you. He will richly welcome you into the kingdom. That, that being entered into the kingdom is another rich gift that you will be abundantly supplied. So back to considering the false teachings. What do we learn with this about grace? It is to be valued and not taken lightly. And knowledge, knowledge of Jesus grows through studying him and following him, but it is not the foundation for grace. Grace has been given freely. We know God because we love God. And growth, probably the more controversial part about this, where the false teachings go across. Because if you go into this and you just focus on 5 through 8 as here's what you have to do, you're missing the point. What does it really say about growth? What is Peter trying to convey to his audience? What do we understand today? Is that growth is a natural result of appreciating God's grace, seeing our faith and God's promises as the mess, most precious items in our lives, and being a disciple of Jesus in action. Growth is multifaceted. It's not just a change of behavior. It starts with a change of focus. And a change of priority. And growth happens because of that. If you're trying to grow in these by just putting your effort, guess what? You already know it's short term and you will fail and you will be frustrated. It's not that you don't put in effort, but you put in effort because of a change of thinking. And that's what helps us grow. So I want to encourage us to apply this in any or all of these three ways. This week, consider what is truly precious in your life. Well, how do you know what's precious in your life? 
What do you think about? What do you talk about? What do you spend your time doing? What do you get frustrated when somebody else messes with you? That's precious. Because there comes a time when you have to reevaluate that. Ask yourself if your faith is the pearl of great price that God calls it to you. Isn't that what he says in Matthew? He finds the pearl of great price, what does he give up for it? Everything. Everything. If it was your faith and nothing else in your life, would you still take it? Nothing. I mean, if it meant you had to walk away from everyone and everything, would you take it? Or would you say, I only want faith as long as I can have all the rest of those are going to fade. You can't take anything else with you. The value of following God is he says, if you focus on this, I will give you all of that. But if you focus on that, it corrupts your faith. If you focus on your faith, you will have everything. I will take care of you. Beware of the false teaching that creeps in when we lose focus on Jesus. Isn't that really the foundation of false teaching? It's the foundation of a bad golf shot. Took a look. You don't focus on the right thing. It impacts the whole part. So focus on Jesus. Keep your eye on that foundation, and that's what will carry you through. Because God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We just trust. And we grow because of that relationship. We're going to continue in studying 2 Peter. Sometimes we're going to do larger sections. Sometimes we're going to do smaller sections. It's not that long of a book. Fit it into your reading and just be immersed in the Word and uh, receive the blessing of it that way.